Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to a special edition of Fronteras, A Changing America. Today we put the spotlight on the third judicial district attorney, Mark D'Antonio. From 1997 to 2007, Mr. D'Antonio served as a federal prosecutor for the U.S. Attorney's Office in Las Cruces, where he prosecuted violations of federal criminal law. Since his retirement from that position, Mr. D'Antonio had been in private practice concentrating on criminal and domestic law. He received both his BA in political science and economics and his JD from the University of Maryland. Mr. D'Antonio, so, welcome to Fronteras. Thank you, it's great to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. And you know, in looking uh, at your history of where, you, uh, you know, where you've been and what you've done, I want to start off the conversation by going back several years ago, almost four years mm -hmm. ago, when you ran for district attorney, you stated that, I am running for Doña Ana district attorney because I want to bring a fresh perspective and restore professionalism and leadership to this important office. Do you feel like you've accomplished this goal in the three years that you've been in office? Yes, I, I'm really proud of that. Um, when I said that, I really meant it. Um, I saw a, a DA's office with, with, with no disrespect to the, the, the former DA's who served their, their citizens well. Uh, there were things that I thought that there was a lack of fairness and a lack of urgency in the DA's office. So the first thing we did was clean up all the backlog of cases. Um, and now we're moving very quickly on cases. Now in some cases, it may seem like justice is moving slow. If you can try a major case within a year, that's very, very good. And so we've been moving cases, we've been getting good um, decisions out of the judges, for the most part. We'll talk about sentencing later. Um, so I'm really proud of what we've done. And I think the people who work in the DA's office, both the attorneys and the support staff, are proud to be there and they really feel that doing, doing work, good work, honest work for the county, and because justice matters and they're bringing justice to Daniela County. What were some of the issues you, you had to address as you looked, you said backlog cases. Uh, you know, how many years are you looking at and how many well, years have you trimmed it to? We had a strange situation happen when I took office. 10 or 12 of the most senior uh, attorneys decided not to seek reemployment. So, and we, we, so we were down right from the start of my administration, 12, 10 or 12 attorneys, senior attorneys. And we also had trials that were pending that first week in, in, uh, in January. Um, so we marshaled our resources, we hired good people, and our first priority was, hey, let's get rid of all these backlog cases. And I'm talking about cases like five, six, seven years old. So we did just that. Now, I'm lucky though. I had a great advantage that most people don't have. Um, I have an experience in not only law enforcement, investigation of crimes, but also the prosecution of complex crimes. So I kind of knew where to start. Uh, then I had a wonderful staff. The people I hired, both the young attorneys and my staff, have done such a great job that the folks in Daniela County should be very, very proud of them. They're hard workers and they put justice before their own needs. Let's, let's talk about you know, some of these attorneys. You know, um, one of the things that, that, that I've experienced the 14 years I've been in, you know, Las Cruces is, you know, hiring good people, you know, oh. trying to f find the good people to convince them and sell them in, on the idea of what it is to live in Las Cruces in Doña Ana County. How challenging is it for you to find these good attorneys that, that you know, because you obviously have a pool to yeah. choose from, and, but, you know, to bring them here versus them going elsewhere. Most young attorneys um, who are just graduated law school or, or soon thereafter, want to live somewhere that's exciting, there's a lot to do, you know, and um, Las Cruces is a great family community. Um, the, the best decision I ever made was moving here, but for a young person, it may not be so attractive. So we find people who are looking for a sense of justice, the, the lawyers who really want to do what's right, who really want to right wrongs. You know, there's a misconception out there um, that 
it's a defense attorney does the, the, that really uh, you know does all the wonders for the gets the, the spotlight. The, yeah, <laughs> but a, pro a good prosecutor could do more justice and do more to, to help victims and to make sure defendants are properly um, administered than any defense attorney can ever do. So we bring we have young attorneys who are smart, vibrant, and we, we entice them to come here by telling them that I want to do one thing, justice, and another thing we do is we give the young attorneys a lot of autonomy to make their own decisions. Now, of course, we have set policies and procedures. I keep a, a steady hand on the tiller at all times to make sure, and the supervisors as well, but when you go into a corporate 500 co um, company or a big law firm, you wouldn't have the decision-making capabilities that these young attorneys have um, at, a, at a fairly uh, young age. We monitor them, we make sure they're doing it right, but they do a great job. And, and they have to deal with very difficult cases at very times where cases. they have to use a lot of gut instinct along with the facts. Exa you are exactly right. You know, when you're looking at an autopsy of a three-year-old who was killed allegedly by their parents, that's a hard thing for someone to process. Um, and to try to separate your emotions from what's right to, than to do. But your initial, your initial instinct is we want revenge. But as a prosecutors, we don't have the liberty to seek revenge, so we have to do what's right. And I'm very proud of the makeup of these young, these young attorneys, we're talking about in, the, in, in their late 20s, or early 30s, who make that transition and use their instinct, not their revenge, but their instinct to do what's right, because justice matters. That's, that's what I tell every attorney in my office. Hey, at the end of the day, do you do what's right? Do you do what's just? Whatever the result is, it's okay, as long as that was your goal. You obviously, at one point, were a young attorney. Yes, I and, was. Uh, you, Long time ago. You, you were a US, uh, U.S. Air Force veteran. Yes. And you were an FBI special agent. Mm -hmm. We worked both criminal and foreign counterintelligence matters. Yes. In 1989, you resigned from the FBI to work as an attorney advisor to then U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno. And, you know, she had a lot of very great cases, but some yeah. controversial sure, cases sure. throughout her career. As we look at your career, you came to Las Cruces, and what were you looking for in Las Cruces? Were you looking for something more quiet, mm -hmm. and then you went on to be district attorney? Well, every job I've had has indirectly prepared me to be the DA. Uh, in the military, you learn about leadership, you learn about camaraderie, you learn about being loyal, and that's really important. Um, to be loyal, not to individuals, but loyal to a cause. Then in the FBI, I learned, you know, from the, from the best how to investigate a case, how to uh, ascertain facts, and how to interview people to get the truth. Then when I went to DOJ, where I worked for the FISA court, which is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, um, I worked with the AG developing plans and strategies for anti-terrorism and counter-espionage. So that gave me a, a, a behind-the-scenes thing, a behind-the-scenes look of how things really worked. Um, and that prepared me for what we're facing now. So now when we have terrorist issues, I'm fully abreast of that because I did that, you know, 10 years ago. So um, that's important to be current. When I was with um, DOJ, I um, had a supervisor who was a, used to be a former U.S. attorney. He said, Mark, you know, you really should be doing this. And I never thought about litigation whatsoever. So I was a temporary, um, litigator with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C., fell in love with it. There's no job like it, best job in the world to be a prosecutor as far as I'm concerned. Because your job is to do what's right. Uh, with that, once I did that, I, I, I kind of shotgunned um, some resumes out there. I was always been enamored with the Southwest. Um, I, I wanted to start a family, um, and so I was offered a job here and took it and never looked back. It's been a great experience in my life. As you talk about being a litigator, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you know, and the defense attorney mm -hmm. relationship right. you may have. I mean, it's obviously very adversarial, or can very be very ad adversarial, should be, and should be. But you know, at the end of the day, you, you both are doing what you believe in. You know, but they believe in their client as being uh, innocent. Right. You believing the opposite. Now, a defense attorney has a job to zealously defend his defendant, his client. Uh, I have an, an exact opposite job where if I believe this, this individual committed a crime, to zealously prosecute that individual. Now, 
One cannot work without the other. A strong public defender's office makes a strong prosecution office and vice versa. It's a symbiotic relationship along with the court that can't be separated. Uh, so although we fight hard battles in the courtroom, I mean, and, and, and I won't give up, I'm a pit bull. However, at the end of the day, when justice is served, then, you know, we uh, have a good night to the defense attorney and we don't walk away as enemies, or at least I don't for my part. Uh, they might not like me, but uh, I certainly have no animosity as defense bar. They're a necessary part of the process. But um, in the courtroom, though, I, it, it's a different story. Um, my duty is to, it's to, the, it's to the victims and to the people of Daniel County. As the district attorney, mm -hmm. um, now for three years, you must deal with all kinds of crimes, everything from robberies, mm -hmm. assault, murder, and because of our unique location here in Las Cruces, you must also deal with border violence, yes. with uh, you know violence, drug trafficking, and public corruption. Mm -hmm. And what does a typical day for you look like? Is there such a thing as a typical day? No, there's not, but no, every day is unique. Um, but situations come up, um, we try not to be too reactive. We try to set in policies and programs. Proactivity is one of my, my mantras because by trying to get ahead of the curve, we can prevent crime before it happens. Because let's face it, if your family member is injured by a violent crime, it's too late you know, mm -hmm. to, uh, to clean that mess up, you know what I mean? So we try to um, prevent crime. But to get back to your question though, the border issues are very important. And here's one of the biggest border issues that I see is in the area of domestic violence. Um, there are some unscrupulous men and sometimes women, who will abuse their wife or spouse. And maybe these couple is, are undocumented in the United States. And so they say, the husband or the friend will say, if you come forward and try to charge me with a crime, I'll let everybody know that you're undocumented and you have to leave the country. And so people are victimized, abused, and feel helpless. We've made it known clear and loud through all the, all the southern parts of our county, everywhere there was a high um, Hispanic population, that being undocumented or uneducated is no impediment from reporting crimes. We work with Catholic charities and, and give these uh, victims visas or um, allow them to stay in the country uh, if they're victim of crimes and they cooperate. It's very important that everybody feels safe in our community. You know, so. That mixed with the obvious drug crimes that happened on the border. Drug crimes equal violence. That's just the way it is. I spent 12 years prosecuting serious drug cartels and crimes as a federal uh, U.S. attorney. So we have in place a systematic approach to helping victims and also trying to combat um, crimes that are spawned by drug use and drug um, trafficking. Is it a challenge? for you as you look at you know the, the Hispanic population that may not speak English, to find prosecutors, to find attorneys that may be bilingual or that are bilingual, uh, you know, to recruit them and offer them a, almost a very key position. Yeah. That helps, it really does. We are, we're always looking for bilingual in all capacities in our, uh, in our my profession and in, in my employees is very important. Though I will say, we do have a very good methodology we have in place. We have uh, access to interpreters. We have many um, dual language speakers in our office. We have victim advocates that are, that are bilingual who have direct contact with our victims and help them through a seemingly insurmountable uh, obstacle. Uh, when, you, when you are a victim of a crime, uh, especially as a foreign speaker, not, it's very intimidating. But I'm very proud to say that we have men and women who have dedicated their careers to helping people who need any kind of help a victim could need, especially a language issue. For most of us, you know, that are kind of sheltered, that yeah. you know, we're at our home and we like to watch the news and mm -hmm. we see these things happening, there's many drug trafficking issues in, in our community that you must encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a serious problem for Dona Ana County how much of this is continuing to happen? And are there any new tricks or things that you're learning in the time that you've been prosecutor? Yes. Well, I don't know if I learned them new because the 
don't forget, I, I came into this, into this job with almost you know, 11 years of drug enforcement mm -hmm. experience. Um, and the intelligence we used in counterintelligence in DOJ, Department of Justice, is the same kind of intelligence operation we use when we're trying to break down what's happening in the world of drug traffic. But let me say this first of all. Kudos to the police officers, the sheriffs, under, under, under Sheriff B. Hill and, and LCPD, LCPD and the people, at, uh, the, the officers at Anthony for really being their front line. We are very fortunate here in Daniela County to have a great police force who are on the front line of fighting drugs and trafficking. Now, also what I've utilized is I have a very good connection with the U.S. Attorney, David Martinez, and obviously the U.S. Attorneys who work here. So we have worked together with the federal government in a comprehensive way to attack the drug issues. We use some drug and addiction, we, 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 um, we transfer cases back and forth when necessary, and also kudos to the Attorney General of uh, New Mexico, Hector Balderas, who's been deeply involved in helping my office and other offices combat the drug issue. So between the Attorney General uh, of New Mexico, the federal government, dedicated and hardworking police officers, and my staff, we've, been, we've really been pushing hard against the war on drugs. When I go into a fast food restaurant, they mm -hmm. ask me, would you like some fries with that? <laughs> and you know, sometimes I, I consider it a challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for you, how do you go about when you are, a case is brought before you mm -hmm. and you, know, you have to look at this case carefully? I mean, what's the process? that you go through mm -hmm. to decide whether or not you need to prosecute this case? The first thing you have to do, which is very important, is you have to separate the politics from the facts and law of the case. Now, that sounds easy to do, but in some cases it's not. You really have to focus uh, because everything can have a, impl a political implication. So the first thing I do is make sure you know the facts and the law. Uh, separate any political concerns. So what's right for a Republican or Democrat or an Anglo or an Hispanic, Jewish, Catholic, it doesn't matter. All, all that goes by the wayside. Then you look at, do the facts violate a certain law? And if, if law, what, what's the law and what does the law require? Each law that presented has elements of the offense, which means every law you have to prove a certain amount of facts. Can we prove those facts beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law? Once I'm convinced that, or my staff is convinced that that's, that's doable, then we go ahead and prosecute the case in a zealous manner with eye towards what the, would make the victim whole. How can we help the victim? Is putting away a man for, or a woman for 20 years going to help the victim? If that's so, that's what we'll do. Is getting restitution for the victim more important than jail time? That. So we really concentrate on what's right, the fact of the case, the law and the victim's responsibilities and what they want to see happen in the case. One final word, the decision whether to prosecute is always my decision. It's never the victim's decision, but we take the victim's input very, very seriously. If you were to look at, you know, what's the process though uh, of making this decision? I mean, is this something that you give yourself a timeline to say by this time I need to decide or you know uh, telling you know your attorney I need more evidence. Okay when when a case comes in we have an, uh, an intake unit um, and the police officer will present the case and we must first the first step is determining whether probable cause exists that a crime has been committed and the person accused committed the crime. That's the very first step. Now probable cause is more likely than not. That's the first step. Once we establish that we intake the case and then we may require the police to give us more information so we can make the next determination is can we prove this case beyond a, a, a reasonable doubt in a court of law and does it have enough to go before a grand, a grand jury which makes another probable cause determination. On a daily basis those decisions are made by my staff, uh, a staff that I trust and have, have a proven track record of making very good decisions. Now, in certain cases, high profile cases or cases that are controversial, then I'm presented the facts of the case and the law by my staff in the meeting. 
two or three senior attorneys and myself would get together. They'll explain to me everything. I, I will have reviewed the case and the law myself. Then we discuss the, all the issues regarding the merits of the case. Are the witnesses strong? Are there any possible defenses? Does the law allow us to do what we want to do? Issues like that, we look at it very carefully, and then they, they give me the, all those facts, and then I make a decision whether to proceed or not to proceed. What case, since you have been district attorney, has touched you the most? Well, the case, first case that comes to mind that, that upsets me the most, um, and I'm still not happy with it, and that is a recent case um, that the baby uh, was found in the basket um, at her in his father's possession, the baby had was deceased. That case was strung along by the previous administration. We came in and we prosecuted it within the first month I was there. Uh, I had asked my young attorneys to take that case and run with it, uh, even though they had, didn't have full time prepare for it. The case was held in Albuquerque. They did an excellent job, a fabulous job, of prosecuting that case. Um, but then the case was overturned in the Supreme Court because the, the, because the case took too long to bring to trial. So you have the man was, uh, his case was reversed by the Supreme Court, therefore he's not guilty um, as a matter of law. But you have a dead baby in our community that didn't receive justice because of a time delay in the case. And we tried everything in our power to bring justice, but we were thwarted by um, people who don't believe that justice delayed, just denied. And that's the case that really sticks with me. What does the future of crime look like for our district? I think the good news is, is that we're bucking the national trend by our crime rates are not accelerating to nearly any proportion that other, other, other jurisdictions are feeling. But what we have to be ever vigilant for is if our economy um, is not doing well and we have some desperate people, uh, that's a breeding ground for crime. Also, criminals are getting more sophisticated. There are tools out there which prevent, uh, for example, there's new phone encryption which it makes it virtually impossible for police officers to um, get information from phones from people when people commit crimes. So there's a, a technological advantage to all of us that we're experiencing that's good for us. We want to call our families with cell phones, but it, hurt, it helps the criminals, in fact, it helps them hide what they're doing. And cri criminals are getting more sophisticated. Um, so we need to keep up with that. And uh, we're, we're doing so far, we're, we're on pretty even ground. The community has to be more, what I see is the community becoming more isolated with cell phones and iPhones and iPads and texting. So the community has to be more willing to cooperate with the police to help us fight crime. Now, one more thing, I, I know you have a, a teenage daughter. This sexting, uh, which is made possible by technology, uh, is a serious issue. There are young women that are being exploited and sometimes hurt physically by this whole um, sending naked pictures over the phones and things of that nature. Um, and that's something we're trying to educate once again. The DA's job is to try to prevent crime as well as prosecute crime. So we've been really going to the schools, being proactive, trying to stop you know, these kind of, which seems like, oh, no big deal. It is a big deal. Well, it's technology that didn't exist, yeah. you know, 10 years ago, so you're dealing with it. As a prosecutor, this is your job, but you're also a politician. Yes, sir, I am. And as a politician, what are some key issues that you must address in order for you to do your job well? Well, I think one of my, one of my key responsibilities as a politician slash DA is to go to the legislature. I was there all last week and express to them in clear terms what I need, the, what tools do I need to do my job. So we present to legislators different bills to fill gaps in legislation, 
to uh, increase penalties for, for violent crimes to a very important example is the Bail Reform Act. Um, we need the ability and judges need the ability to keep dangerous people in jail before trial. That's a fact. Uh, there are people that are willing to hurt you and my family without any remorse or regard. Those people can't be free on bond. They should be held. So I'm urging uh, everyone to adopt that if there's a violent criminal who the state can prove that he's danger to the community, gets no bond. As a matter of policy, in, 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 in all our first degree murder cases, if we can prove, which is in first degree murder cases, not that hard, that uh, that person is a danger to our community, we are recommending no bond. What do you do for fun <laughs> at well, the district attorney's you know, office? For, you know, uh, I, I spend, I'm a family guy. One reason why I, I moved here and why I'm ha very happy in Las Cruces, it's a very family orientated uh, community. Nothing makes me happier than throwing the football with my son. This Sunday we were, um, this Sunday we were in Veterans Park playing flag football with a bunch of friends. And that to me is total relaxation. Also, my office has been really great in helping our community. Um, during Christmas, we helped on the on the privileged children. I, I'm, I'm very active in the um, celebrity waiter um, program that we have that raises money for, for various charities. And so, um, at the end of the day, what makes me satisfied is to have a safe community. Mark D'Antonio, I want to thank you for coming in. It's been my pleasure and joining us. Thank you for joining us on Fronteras, a changing America. I'm at Mudo Have a safe and pleasant day.